Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Dr. Arv Such, and I'll be your host for this evening's session, uh, Post-COVID-19 Financial Planning for Dental Professionals. In this webinar, we'll start off with a presentation by Ron Hake, who will provide an update on the current state of financial planning for dentists, and we'll finish off today's session with a Q&A. We're going to be about 40 minutes or so with the presentation, and then uh, after that, we'll take some questions and answers. So before I introduce Ron, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I in the year 2000. So I've been a practicing dentist for uh, a little over 20 years now. Um, I became a client of Nicola Wealth uh, right after 2008. Uh, I was looking for a place to kind of uh, get my structures in line, and that included tax planning, uh, estate planning. Uh, and really, when I joined the firm as a client, uh, it was out of a sense of frustration more than anything else. And over the past 10 years, as I've been a client of theirs, uh, I asked them for a position within the firm uh, because I believed in them so strongly uh, and what they did for me. And I I just want to get the message out, out to dentists that, uh, you know, the reality is only a small percentage of dentists uh, are actually able to retire uh, to, the, uh, uh, to what they've dreamed of. For most, uh, the majority, uh, they, we really don't have an idea of what the, our fate is. So my work is really about helping dentists move from the majority to the minority. Uh, before I was a dentist, I actually was a pharmacist. I practiced for a year, so I have an idea of that profession as well. And I did uh, work the friendly, uh, the friendly Skies with Air Canada for three years as a flight attendant. So um, that's a little bit about myself. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Ron Hake, who's a senior financial planner for Nicola Wealth and our regional manager in Ontario. Prior to joining Nicola Wealth, Ron led the Wealth Management Division at CDSPI for 10 years, overseeing nearly a billion dollars in investments uh, exclusively for dentists. So both Ron and I have a really good idea of what dentists, their problems are, their issues are, uh, managing practices, even being associates, managing teams, managing staff. Uh, uh, We've, we've seen a lot of it. So uh, we, come at, we come at this from a different angle than some of the other, the, some of the other people uh, you'll have exposure to. Uh, so without further ado, Ron, over to you. Thank you so much, Arv. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, our intent really is to take you through a process uh, targeted and designed uh, around the discussions we have with dental professionals. A little bit about who we are as a firm um, quickly is our firm was founded in 94. We're licensed as an investment counselor across Canada with offices uh, right across uh, BC. We're in Toronto, but we serve nationally our clients. We manage a little over $7 billion. Our focus obviously is, is private wealth management and professionals make up a, a big, big portion of what we do for our clients. In terms of why planning and COVID planning specifically, uh, and this is what we as a firm do. We start with planning first and foremost. And, before COVID-19, dentistry was seen as bulletproof. You just you know, show up, keep earning, work hard, manage your staff, manage the patient flow, and save along the way. And then the hope was that you know, at the end, you would monetize your, your work uh, at seven to nine times EBITDA, roughly. Ron, Ron, would you explain a little bit about what uh, EBITDA means uh, when it comes to these valuations? Sure, Arv. So EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciate, depreciation, and amortization. So for a typical practice in Canada, uh, grossing a general dentist grossing about $1.5 in billings, the ROI or return on investment is about 23%. That's a national average for general practitioners. So 23% of $1.5 is about $345,000 of EBITDA. So for this last bullet point, if we were thinking I'm going to sell seven times, you might expect to see somewhere around $2.4 million. Uh, if you got lucky and got, were able to sell it nine times, uh, you were going to get somewhere around $3.1 And this is a big part 
of actually many, many uh, dentists' financial plan is the monetization at the end. And that seven to nine times uh, was typically offered by larger consolidators. Um, most of the deals that we've seen over the last number of years would involve 80% cash up front with an earnout period and a 20% uh, hold back. And I think uh, I want to hold on to that last point because it, it's changed a lot and I'll speak to that in a moment. So after COVID, you know, there is no normal going back to normal. Dentistry is changing as our restaurants, as our movie theaters, every, every industry has changed and been, been affected. Um, until there's truly a vaccine that's effective, there might not be a normal. There's just adaptation. So what that means is at this time, your earnings have taken a hit. So, you know, for a number of months, many of you are not practicing. There is no earnings. You're not savings. But at the same time, the investments you have saved have also taken a hit in, in, in many cases. And then finally, the valuations have dropped in terms of change. So what I'm hearing in the marketplace is now uh, it might be five and a half to seven times EBITDA and 20% cash up front with an 80% deferment or earnout. And so that changes things a lot. And why have valuations dropped? Why have terms changed? Quite frankly, it's because of a possible second wave in the office. And that, that event that's happened over the last three months, it's important for us as dentists to get a grip on where we are uh, because it's been a tough three months. Uh, you know, I sold one of my practices about four years ago. The EBITDAs were around uh, three to four at that time. And I have two other practices that I'm involved with. And we were banking a lot on what the valuations of these practices were as we were getting ready to retire. Uh, we're my partners are, and I at this point are hunkering down for a bit. But what, what, what's really important, Ron, when it comes down to having a practice during the next year to two, how do uh, practices stay alive and not only stay alive, but really thrive during this environment? Because there are competitive differences that you can set yourself aside from some of the, uh, the competition that's out there. Absolutely. So from a business planning perspective, it's important to plan for that. So, you know, you're going to put in whatever infection protocols are required by your local regulator, your provincial regulator. You're going to put in uh, protocols and processes and procedures in place to deal with um, uh, possibly a patient calling you up a week from now and saying, hey, I have COVID. Yeah. I don't know where I got it, but I'm notifying you of that. What's the impact to your business? So there's the day-to-day -day, um, hygiene part of it. There's the day-to-day -day dentistry part. But what's the financial impact? And how does that tie in? So this is why we think whether you're a dentist or whether you're a professional of any kind, planning is number one. And business yeah. planning and personal financial planning are integrated in more ways than one for dentists. So let's look at some typical planning examples. And we're not gonna get into uh, uh, significant details on any one of these. We'll touch on, on almost all of them though. You know, you might work with an advisor or your accountant and you're gonna have a discussion on whether, whether you take salary or dividends, um, whether you're gonna look at your wills and estates, tax efficient asset allocation. These are all different types of planning examples. And what they have in common and what they're really uh, about in my mind is really about cash flow. Cash flow is the centerpiece for your business, your personal ties into your finance, your profit operation. And that's why we're going to focus a lot of our talk today on the cash flow and specifically how it relates to pandemic. And that's where that 23% number comes in uh, because you pay yourself as a dentist. That's independent of the uh, profitability of the practice itself. What's very important is to maintain your cash flows, especially at a time like this where there, most of us are at a place where we're some of us at anywhere from 50 to 70% of our cash flows. Uh, from what we're used to. And that uh, we need to make uh, some sort of a, a buttress against what's happening. And, and there are ways to do that. Uh, proper planning will help in that, certainly. Absolutely, Arv. And when we talk about what proper planning is for a dentist, I, I often equate this to a treatment plan. If I were coming into your office today, Arv, uh, and you're seeing you uh, as my dentist and I as your patient, 
um, you were going to put a treatment plan. You're going to do, um, you're going to, you're going to look around uh, inside my mouth. You're going to take x-rays. We're going to have an, a discussion around my oral history. You may have even requested previous uh, charts and so forth. So financial planning is no different than that. It really, financial planning is about taking what looks like a a mess, uh, a jumble of different things, putting the different pieces together and having that come out as to like a finely tuned watch. And you gotta keep tuning it over time. And that's why we as patients keep coming back to the dentist. It's not a one and done. We're coming regularly for our oral hygiene uh, checkups and we're, we're, you are empowering us to make good decisions. You're informing us of what we do. But ultimately, as a, as a patient of a dentist, that empowerment it rests with me. I've got to take this information. I've got to act on it. So what sort of information are we looking for? What are the components of approach? And the first step, as I said, is a financial plan. And that's different for different people. But we gather the data. That's the first piece. The second piece is we look at, compile and review a fact pattern and we may return back to a one or two page executive summary so that we have a, a mutual understanding of how we see things. A identify and discuss your different goals and objectives, whether they're short term or whether they're a bit long, mid or longer term, and they're different for different people. Certainly retirement is one piece of it. And financial independence is that ultimate goal for most of our clients. And we define financial independence as never eating into your capital. Just having those retirement assets grow for you and to be able to sustain your retirement by doing that. And again, that's through cash flow. And we'll talk about that a bit later. So if the first component of that financial plan is gathering the information, the second component is the investment asset allocation. So the third step and the final step perhaps in, in that uh, investment allocation is then the security selection or the manager selection. We'll get into that a bit later, but one of the things that I'd so, like so, each so Ron, of you- So Ron, are you yes. saying that the, uh, the stock picking itself is less important than where you're invested and what types of investments that you have? Great question. So about 92% of your, re your return on your portfolio is gonna be determined through your asset allocation. But as important is the asset composition. So it's not enough to say I've got you know, this much in stock and this much in bonds. There's gotta be different types of assets beyond stocks and bonds, and we'll get into that. And then within those allocations, whether it's stocks, bonds, or private assets, it then only matters, you know, the kind of security selection and, it's, and tax efficiency is a big part of that. So thank you for asking. Um, where that uh, takes us to are questions that I would want each one of you to know the answer to, to think about. First is what rate of return have you earned after fees for the last one, three, five, and 10 years. Second question you should know is, is your compensation the most tax effective it could be? What tax rates are you paying on non-registered assets? What income is being generated annually by your current portfolio? And what percentage of that is of your retirement needs? And just in, and as important as what's the most tax efficient way to build that capital. So it's not just about income, it's tax efficient income. And then lastly, you know, how will you monetize, best monetize the equity in your practice? And that's a question that uh, we would work with you on, not in terms of saying, you know, how to prepare your practice for sale in terms of, you know, uh, whether it's hygiene or, or those numbers, but structuring the sale of your, your, your investment, the sale of your business in the most tax efficient way. And then that leads to uh, what is the tax liability in your state? So these are questions that each one of you should uh, have an answer to or have an indication of and be working with your advisors towards accommodating and getting those, that information. So when we talk about comprehensive planning for us, it's integrated, it's meaningful to you, it's not generic and it's fluid. The moment um, you get a financial plan from us or from an, a, a firm of any kind, that's a static document. We wanna make sure that that's continuously changing. Of course, I don't come to you one time as a patient and then everything is good forever. Things are changing. 
my oral health is constantly uh, changing and that's why I need to come on a regular basis. So when we talk about comprehensive planning, most people will focus on retirement income modeling and that's certainly a good place to start. Then they might move to a stock and bond approach. We look at a, a, a charitable, we look at charitable giving. We look at collaborating with your accountant. We look at business succession, many different things and at different stages there there are different levers that need to be pulled. So planning, what's your bucket list priority? So we talked about making this meaningful to you, whether it's gifts to your kids or grandkids, whether it's now, later, do you wanna give some money away? Are you philanthropically minded? Do you wanna buy a second property? How much do you wanna travel? So all of these things, we need to create a plan before you sell and before you invest. Too often, many people just go right into investing. That's why we look at a plan first. So the way we manage our plan is through a workbook, a digital financial plan that actually sits in our client portals and clients can access on a regular basis. And while this looks like a busy slide, I'll highlight a few key items, which is where we capture your different assets, whether they're registered, non-registered, we arrive at a net worth. That net worth, allows us to then drive the discussion with respect to what assets are available for retirement. We can see that in our example here, there's about a million dollars. That then translates into our digital workbook. And this is where we start some of the scenario analysis. We're able to look at different things like your age, of course, and these are the different variables, how many years you're gonna be in retirement, what we might expect in terms of your average tax rate, and of course, uh, what your legacy portfolio might look like. And most important, and we're gonna talk about this a bit later, what's my retirement income after tax? Because really that's what's important is what's in your genes. So what we're able to arrive is, what is the required real rate of return? So what's the re required rate of return I need? Less inflation, to keep ahead. And that translates into how much do I have to save today? So when we look at the different scenarios, gifts to family at that point, we can say, oh, okay, what else is important to you? We're gonna model out whether you wanna buy a recreational property. We're gonna work with you on travel, okay, in retirement and while you're working. And is there a family legacy that, uh, that's important to you? Do you so wanna leave money behind? Ron, you and I have chatted many times in the past about questions that uh, we get from dentists. In your mind, when, we're, when, they're, when they're looking at their future and their retirement plans, uh, what's the most common question that you get? Uh, by far, the most common one is the one we're going to answer next, which is really uh, the question we get is, how much money can I spend? Right? And one, one of the ways to look at this is just simple uh, variables like we looked at here. And again, we're always checking in on these variables and making sure that they're still valid on a continuous basis. So let's take a scenario uh, that we often come across, and, and this is actually based on a, on a dentist client that we had. Uh, they had three million of investable assets after their practice sale. Um, they were uh, roughly at an, a 20% average tax rate. The income results that you're gonna show are taxed and indexed to inflation. They're gonna get some CPP, some OAS, um, and I wanna show you the impact of the returns between 2% and 5%, because the goal here is to preserve your capital after inflation. Remember earlier where I said that for us, our clients, for them to have financial independence is to preserve that capital after inflation. So let's look at the impact of returns on spending. Um, we're gonna look at 2% rate of return on your portfolio, all the way up to 5%. And so your after-tax income between two and 5%, when you think, well, it's only 3% more, but it actually translates into 100% more spendable income. So that's why the impact of returns are so important. Let's look at it the other way, which is how much money do I have to have, or how much capital do I have to have, investments, in order to generate $180,000 of after-tax income? Same assumptions, but we're gonna look at it a little differently. So under a 2% scenario, if you're able to earn 2% on your portfolio, you need nearly $10 million. 
when you start to see the difference, the material difference, if you can generate a 5% return relative to a 2% return, again, that 3% return means you only need 60% less capital. So it's important that when you are looking at your financial planning and planning post COVID, what's the impact of cash flows? What's the impact of return? And we're gonna, we're gonna delve into that a little bit more. So what else impacts your plan in terms of COVID? Certainly tax reform, we'll talk about that shortly. Markets, we all have seen the, the wild ride we've had over the last little while. Just as important isn't what's happened to markets, but what the future returns might look like. Your behavior is just as important. So let's touch upon economics at first. Economics is a full-on presentation. At any point, you can have a, a, a full-on webinar. And in fact, um, market economics and, and market uh, outlook is something we just recently did. Our CEO, John Nicola, just recently did a 2020 strategic outlook uh, on this. And after this presentation, we'll send out a survey with a link to this presentation. So for the purposes of today's presentation, I'm not gonna get too deep into this. Ron, that's, that's probably a good thing because as dentists, uh... We, uh, we were able to go by all the topics and subjects uh, and avoid economics, uh, and unfortunately, much to our dismay in many cases. Uh, so we, we do have to, for me, I need it kept simple when it comes to these economic terms as well. Yeah, so I, 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 there is a lot of great information on John's uh, presentation. I would encourage mm -hmm. everybody to take a, a look at yeah. that. So we talked about future returns are just as important. So if you look at, the, few, the returns, the five-year returns for a typical 60% equity, 40% bond or fixed income portfolio after inflation and fees, after what's known as a Cape Peak, which we recently hit last year, these are the different years benchmarks. And on average, you're flat to negative. Now remember, our goal is to get 4% after inflation and fees, 6% less our 2%. So if we know that that's gonna be a problem going forward in terms of future returns. How do we accomplish that? The other thing we talked about just briefly, I mentioned was your behavior as an investor. Typical emotional investor is, you know, wow, things are going great. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm excited about what's going on in the market. I'm the most you know, brilliant individual. Um, and then markets sort of start to come off and then you wonder whether you should be a long-term investor. You know, you start to see capitulation on March 23rd, which we saw, you know, in the markets. And then you decide, I got to get out. There's a lot of great uh, information out there on emotional investing. And we've got an upcoming podcast with Dr. Daniel Crosby, who's an expert in this area. So um, please go to our website, subscribe. You'll get a great podcast in the next few weeks on that. So what does this emotional investor translate into? It means we're our own worst enemies as individual investors. So this uh, shows us investor performance versus the S&P 500 and then the cost of, of emotions, if you will. And what's that shown us is a four to 5% annual loss over a long period of time, whether it's one all the way up to 30 years. So we know that a little difference goes a long way because over the next five years, we expect muted returns. We know that we are as individual uh, individuals, maybe uh, our own worst enemy and we get in our way. So what are the things that we wanna look at? Overall planning is important. We know retirement income is a big piece. We talked about markets and econ economics and we talked about returns and the emotional behavior. So how do we at Nicola, how do we do what we do in order to mitigate a lot of these, these things that we have no control over? We have no control over markets and, and economics. Um, it's very difficult to overcome emotion and behavior. So we're gonna look at it in really four pieces, taxation, asset allocation, cash flow, and strategic rebalancing. The first part we're gonna look at is, uh, you know, the, the, the Canadian Income Tax Act, and we're not gonna go into too much detail today, um, but our belief in terms of before we get into the philosophy of construction and portfolio management, it is a very specific scenario to your scenario and a specific fact pattern, if you will. It's a complex area, there's a lot of vagueness, it's open to interpretation, it's unique to each individual and requires a specific fact patterns to be assessed. 
And so while we're not accountants and we're not going to hold ourselves out that way, we certainly understand uh, the many different intricacies related to planning for dentists and work with your accountants directly. Mm -hmm. Some of the strategies that we would look at in the past, certainly it was either a salary versus dividends, but income splitting and tax on split income in 2017 took care of a lot of that. And so we're going to get into a little bit of corporate tax planning and how it's integrated with your personal scenario. So we've got a slide up here. It says active income and passive income. Active income is the income you earn in, the, in doing dentistry. Passive income would be income earned in your, on your investments within the portfolio, your professional corporation. So the government came up with something wonderful called AAII, Adjusted Aggregate Investment Income. And it, it's designed to integrate uh, professional corps and uh, holding companies and CCPCs into what uh, a typical individual might have. So the important point here to gather is that for every dollar of investment earnings over 50,000, you get a $5 reduction, a one to five or five to one on your small business eligibility. And so let's look at how that impacts you with an example. In this case here, let's say we have $50,000 of passive income within your corporation using a 50% marginal tax rate, you would be expected to pay $25,000 in tax. However, if you had 60,000, a bump up of 10, okay, so you're gonna pay 30,000, again, 50% of 60. But this is where the small business deduction comes in. Remembering our five to one rule, you had $10,000 of additional passive income, you've now lost 50,000 of small business deduction, which translates into an additional tax to your corp of 7,500. So the net effect is you had a $10,000 increase in passive income, but your total tax was actually greater than the passive income. And so that's 125% of passive income. That's 10,000. What if your passive income rises from 50 to 150,000, an increase of 100, your corporate taxes actually will rise by 125,000. So Ron, uh, to paraphrase, you're, you're paying more in tax than you've made in that instance. Uh, what Absolutely. Are, what are some of the strategies uh, that can be used to minimize this tax drag? Because that, it's a significant difference when you're expecting your investment income uh, to be providing for you uh, and you're still working in your practice? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, there are a number of strategies you can look at, and we would uh, suggest looking at a number of them. So certainly one of them uh, is the use of IPPs or individual pension plans. The great thing about these is they can eliminate a tax on large corporate gains. There are some transfers of retirement assets to children tax-free, and you can fund your own pension plan. And if you have a spouse who's actively an employee of the company, uh, that's even better because you can get a, a larger bump up there. And what that does is the use of the IPP also is really important at a time when you want to sell your practice. And as I said, for will and estate planning. But there are other strategies to look at. Uh, starting July the 1st, um, prescribed rate loans go down from 2% to 1%. This really allows you to do income splitting with minors or your family trust. Again, depending on the province of residence, uh, some, some professional corporations or, 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 or dental professional corporations are allowed to be owned by lower income family members or family trusts. You might want to look at crystallizing losses, but you need to look at the superficial loss rule first. You want to have a discussion with your accountant about whether you have a capital dividend account balance that you may want to pay out first. You may want to look at a surplus strip strategy, which is basically removing corporate funds and having them treated as a capital gain, which is more advantageous than a dividend. And there are things called non-CCPC planning and where your corporate tax rate can essentially be reduced from 50% to 27% and really no need to pay tax on personal dividends to get that out. Other things that we'd look at work with you on and your accountant, whether it's the refundable dividend tax on hand, leveraged life insurance, charitable giving, use of flow through shares, on and on. The important thing to keep in mind is that this is case by case. Everyone is different. You need to speak with your planner and accountant. And I would often say that it's better to have them speak to each other. Um, instead of me, you know, uh, asking your front office staff to 
to ask you a question, it's probably best that I ask you that question as a patient. And you and I have that dialogue. And so that's why it's really great when your planner and accountant are working together. Not all strategies are, are, are crystal clear. Sometimes you do have different shades of grade and you certainly need to find your own comfort zone, whether it's about income splitting with spouse and kids. But planning is often different from accounting. You all have what I call multiple competing priorities. We want to lower taxes, but there are other objectives that you might want to meet. And so it's about understanding what's really most important to you and always keep flexible. Because one thing we know, tax environment changes frequently. And, you know, even right now we're considering all this money that the government's giving away. How do we ensure uh, that it's going to be paid for? And, and it's likely through an increase in taxes somewhere along the way. I think so, that's a great point, though, Ron, with respect to the uh, the planning and the accounting part of it. I know I have a fantastic accountant, uh, uh, yet he thinks it he thinks of my wealth from an annual fi filing point of view. So what I have used in the past is my advisor at Nicola Wealth to kind of communicate the wealth building part of things, and uh, that's been a big boon for me with respect to um, minimizing taxes, but also seeing what the big picture is in five, 10, 20 years from now. Yeah, you gotta be looking down the road at all times and you gotta be adjusting your sales. So what else, great point. So what else impacts your, your plan? We looked at these different things. One thing that often gets overlooked is the portfolio uh, asset allocation or the portfolio construction. And we think, you know, in the old days it was, you know, 50, you know, if you were a conservative investor, 50 stocks, 50 bonds and so forth, aggressive or moderate. Um, we really don't think that's the way to do it. And we would think that it's never been the right model. And if you look at high net worth investors globally, uh, they would agree. They've all got an alternative asset allocation. They maybe have an allocation to real estate as well. If you look at globally, uh, the Capgemini 2018 World Wealth Report, same thing. It tells you the same thing. They've all got allocation to real estate uh, and alternatives and their equities are less. When we talk about real estate, we're talking about cash flow, commercial real estate, not your own home, for example. And we look at this at institutional money pensions and pension plans. All of us are owners of the CPP. CPP is doing the same thing. So why wouldn't you invest like that? And why shouldn't you be able to uh, invest like that? And when you look at some of the more successful ones like the teacher's pension plan here, and when you look at what their allocation is, they've done really well with a, a large allocation to those different alternatives. And even the Harvard Endowment Fund has been able to grow their assets substantially. So when you look at um, what we do and how we do it, we really do it in a very similar fashion. We have an allocation as well. And this is all going to tie back into cash flow, which is planning, whether it's real estate, we have an allocation of private equity, private debt. And at the same time, we do participate in the equities, but to a smaller degree than most, most uh, individuals. So this is an interesting uh, fact. Uh, how much is the world worth? It's worth about $228 trillion, uh, but only about 70 trillion of that is in, in equities. Um, there is uh, about 168 trillion in residential real estate, that's our homes. And there's uh, a piece in agriculture and forestry and commercial. So when you look at global invest a lot, investable assets and you look at about 20% are multifamily apartment buildings, commercial is 11, farm and timber is 11. Public equities only make up about 23%, small allocation to gold. Ask yourself if 42% of the global investable assets are in this asset class and only 23% are in public equities, why would you have a portfolio of 60% in that scenario? And part of the reasons that people look at these alternative asset classes is because historically T-bills and bonds, while they did provide uh, reasonable rates of return with very little volatility, we know that's not the case on a go forward basis. We know that real estate has provided a reasonable rate of return with reasonable volatility and it's almost exactly the same rate of return as equities, but with half the risk. And that's where it comes down to liquidity and behavior. So when we start looking at our portfolio asset allocation, this is what our core model would have looked like at December 2019. And that you can see that about almost 60% are publicly uh, traded assets, whereas almost 40% are privately traded assets. 
And so when we look at that specifically and start to break down the private allocation, we do have an allocation not only to real estate, but mortgages, private debt, and so forth. The important thing here, and I'm gonna show you a couple tax slides, is that 100% of that piece, the mortgages, the private debt, we wanna put all of those into your retirement savings plan, your IPP, your TFSA, and any foundations might have, because they're tax inefficient. These ones here on the left are less taxable on an annual basis. So let's look at how we've done and now I've stripped out just the private assets, not including the fixed income. So over a five year period, if you had a million dollars starting capital, those results are that we had a gross return of about 10.7%, after fees 9.7, and after taxes 9.6. Now, how is that possible? $10,000 on only a $658,000 gain. That's possible because your refundable dividend tax on hand reduces your corporate tax by as much as 60%, Private assets have low turnover. The real estate component creates depreciation, which creates return of capital, which is not taxable, and planning fees are deductible. So if we then include the private assets, the fixed income private assets, how does that change materially? Well, I'm happy to report not really that much. You can see the tax paid is zero in this case, because what we've been able to do, while your returns are still really good, We've been able to put all that interest income into your registered plans, private assets, again, low turnover, portfolios balance within the private assets, and we target a cash flow of 4%. And so I want to stress this piece, the 4% cash flow. We're going to come to it in a minute. So is that we where, do our own, uh, is, yes. is that where uh, asset allocation becomes important with respect to which types of investments are in which accounts, be they registered or non-registered? Yeah, so it's, it's asset allocation, absolutely. But in addition, it's composition of those assets. So for example, our real estate pools, the way it's structured brings a lot of return of capital, which is not taxable. And uh, I highlight our real estate because we are really leaders in this. And we have a team that's dedicated to this. We have about 30 people in-house, that's all they do. Because cash flow is so important to us and to our clients, our asset allocation, you talked about this, is really focused on providing some cash flow from rents, whether it's dividends and options, whether it's interest and dividends on our fixed income. If we can target about a 4% return cash flow from the capital, we're very close to that 6% nominal. Now, why cash flow is important to us? Emotion, 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 really. It smooths out the volatility. You don't have to worry about dipping it into your, um, into your capital. Uh, to meet your lifestyle needs if you're if we're on a cash flow basis. And the way to deal with that is strategic rebalancing. So you initially start off perhaps with four asset classes equally weighted. Over time, we're going to see some deviation. Some asset classes rise faster than others. We're always rebalancing. And we can use those cash flows to rebalance or we can use them to pay out. And what we do is we are looking at this from a uh, holistic perspective. We have two planners who are working with our clients. They are reviewing the portfolio for asset weights and they are looking at this at least every 90 days. And this again goes back to this uh, targeted approach based on each client profile and plan. So with that, I'll just end by uh, letting you know a little bit about us, two planners on every file, um, complementary skill set for each team. And I'm gonna end on what we can do right now. Uh, in post-COVID. I'm going to give you some takeaways as well. Part of the things that we have is a high focus on technology. We want to have private client uh, web access. We have a mobile launch. We are very transparent. This is right off our website. Everything that we talk to our clients about and is on our website. We're one of the only firms in Canada that I believe does this. Our returns have been uh, great over the long run, but it's not because we've taken a lot of risk. If you look at our annual return every year over the last 20 years, only one real down year. And we keep up when markets are moving ahead with a typical 60-40 approach. Because it comes down to cash flow, it comes down to cash flow. So what can you do today, right now? Here's some questions. I started off earlier with some questions and I wanna end, this is the last slide before we take questions. So I wanna end with questions I want you to ask yourself. Do I know what my personal and corporate cash flows are and the timing of them? 
have I looked at the impact to cash flow of a second wave, slowing economy or other potential impacts to my practice? What is the impact to cash flow if markets correct? What is the impact to my practice value if cash flows remain impaired? Because again, for most of you, if there is a, an exit strategy on your practice, it forms part of your retirement assets. And are there things that you can do today to increase cash flow that are within your control? And the answer is absolutely. Off the top of my head, uh, the Canada Emergency Business Account. You can look at something like that. There are things that you can do and you should be doing. And where do you find those answers? Really, it comes back to planning. You got to go to your planning workbook uh, and you got to work with your advisor and ask those questions. So I thank you for your, your patience throughout this presentation. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Arv to moderate the questions. That was great. Thank you, Ron. Uh, uh, I wanted to uh, start uh, the answer question and answer period this point. And uh, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A feature on the bottom of the screen. So Ron, we got a question here. Uh, the question is, what is the biggest mistake you've seen dentists make? And I'm assuming that this person isn't referring to a, a root perforation. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I'll let you take that away. No, unfortunately, all my uh, experiences with my dentists over the years have been good. Uh, so I, I can't comment on the dentistry <laughs> other than to say it was great. Uh, but if we're talking about the biggest mistakes that we've seen from a financial perspective, I would say it's a failure to integrate both the personal and corporate planning. I mean, you, you need to be planning um, and doing scenario analysis on your business at all times um, and looking at some negatives. But also you need to integrate that with the personal planning. All too often, you know, people are doing corporate planning and then over here they're doing financial planning and they're not putting the two together. All right. Uh, there is another question here. Uh, I am retired. Are there uh, any strategies that I can take advantage of? Um, so if you're retired, let's assume you're, 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 you don't have a professional corp. You might have a holding company at this point. So yes, there are strategies that you can take advantage of. Uh, depends on the province uh, as well and, and the goals you have. Uh, certainly donations. If you're philanthropically minded, uh, we at Nicola have uh, a lot of expertise in that uh, as well. Income splitting with your spouse is still an option, uh, as is, uh, I talked about earlier. Just even if you're not married and you're not philanthropically minded, even just the construction of your portfolio, uh, is it the most tax efficient in reducing the tax drag and so that you have more in your pockets? Hmm. Okay. And there's a question... We have one final question here. It looks like, are there any safe havens for investing in this COVID environment? Oh, safe havens. Um, so let me just say that the best investment will always be the quality care that you give your patients and will be your dental practice with a rate of return of, as I said, about 23% in Canada on private assets. Um, it provides you a stable cash flow. And that's probably, I mean, that's a great analysis or, um, segue into why we love private assets, whether it's private real estate, private equity, private mortgages, because they're uncorrelated and you can, uh, because they may not be as, uh, as correlated, you can get a premium from time to time. So um, you don't want to ride the ups and downs of the market, uh, especially in retirement when cash flow is important. Okay. Uh, and we have, we have another question. Uh, if you don't own a practice, what is the best advice you have for a young dentist on acquiring one in the next few years? And I'm hoping that's not one of my associates asking that question. <laughs> um, so the best advice I'd have for a young dentist on acquiring one in the next few years is the same I'd had uh, throughout here. You got to plan for it. So sit down uh, with your advisor, sit down with your accountant. Let's look at what cash flows there are in, in Years past, uh, what we used to get was a situation where um, you would show up as a dentist, uh, you'd accept your uh, diploma, and then on the right-hand side was the bank willing to sign you just with a, a letter, uh, your signature. They would finance you 100%. And many, many years ago, there wasn't the kind of competition there is today. 
So uh, depending on where you want to acquire a practice, whether it's uh, you know an urban setting or a more rural setting, there's going to be different cash flow demands on you, and you need to look at those cash flows, see whether they can sustain, work with practice appraisers. I would actually um, to the to the person who asked this question, I would actually ask you to reach out to Arv directly as well on this one. I think well, Arv, I, I, I can certainly comment on that right now. I, you know, uh, with respect to practice valuations they are on a downswing at this point. And it may be a great opportunity for a young dentist uh, if they're able to uh, borrow the money, because that will be a question of being able to do that as well in the next little while, is to start thinking of acquiring a practice. Owning a business, is, uh, especially a dental business, is always more profitable. It comes with headaches, it comes with uh, uh, other issues, but the returns are, uh, are without doubt much more than if you're using only your two hands uh, to generate profits. You have leverage uh, over uh, over team members, and that's where the business aspect of owning a practice comes in. Uh, and it depends if you're suited for it as well, uh, and what type of practice you want to acquire. So I, I can certainly answer more on that offline. Uh, uh, but uh, it, it, it is a tough go for younger associates uh, they're just coming off the back end of, uh, of all the debt they've acquired uh, through schooling uh, and their skills are still at a place where they're developing speed. Uh, so uh, I, I think getting all the information uh, going forward for uh, the younger associates is very critical, but there are opportunities uh, because the valuations have dropped uh, over the last three months, certainly, and they'll continue I think they'll continue to drop, quite frankly, and unfortunately. Uh, and if I could just say, I mean, long term, we still see dentistry as a fantastic business. So, you know, the timing is, the question is very much like, when do I buy my house? Correct. When you can afford it? Because in 40 years from now, it's not going to matter whether you paid this year's price or next year's price. What is going to matter is that you got in uh, and that you were purposeful in your planning approach. So. You know, you're going to work with uh, an individual to look at your cash flows and how you're going to finance this acquisition. So, great question. There, uh, there's a question here. Uh, QE to infinity. Uh, I imagine that's quantitative e easing is, uh, is, 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 is back in vogue these yeah. days. Uh, what are your thoughts on hyperinflation and gold? So let's talk about quantitative, quantitative easing. So for simplicity, what that means is the printing presses are on. And when governments print money, that leads to, it used to lead to inflation. I want to take everyone back to, you know, 2007, 2008. And oh my God, that was going to be the end of it because 2008, markets were in a, you know, in, in a free fall. And the government stepped in and, and have for many years governments around the world printed money uh, and, and the concern was hyperinflation. And so what we did see was not a rise in interest rates. We didn't see um, gold take off as a result. Had we seen some movement in gold? Absolutely. One could argue that, um, that the lower interest rates and, uh, that, that came out of the result of this actually led to another asset bubble, whether it was, you know, residential real estate, whether it was additional stocks. And we can see that even the last round of quantitative easing that, that we have gone through recently here as a, as a nation and globally has led to an upsurge uh, in markets. So we, as a firm, we do have a position in gold. We're not, uh, and we've got a slight overweight than our traditional model. We see it as a hedge. One of the reasons we typically don't like gold uh, at a bigger position is it's not a cash flow producing asset. So I would rather own an asset that's gonna appreciate over time, maybe be a hedge against inflation and provide cash flow. Um, and real estate might, might be one of those as well. Mm -hmm. So great question. That's great. Uh, well, uh, I think that's it for the questions that, that I'm seeing here, Ron. Thanks everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have any questions, please uh, contact Ron or me on behalf of Nicola Wealth, uh, Ron and myself, thank you for joining us today and uh, have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody.